everyone. It's good to meet with you, even if it is through this medium. Of course, I'm greeting you from the Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire. And as you can see, I'm wearing my shirt that was given to me by the, the students and the staff of the school where we've been teaching uh, foundation stones and foundation stones for teachers. Uh, as you know, Ryan and I were supposed to be uh, 12 or 10 days or somewhere around there and we've now been here three weeks because the virus has closed down the country and there are no more planes coming in or planes going out and so we're going to be here until the Lord opens those doors for us. We just want to thank you. Of course Ryan is doing all the setup of this and we just want to thank you. Ryan and I want to thank you for all your prayers. We want to thank you that you have been so proactive in praying and believing God with us that we will escape. Um, and I also want to thank those of you who are giving towards the fund that allows us to buy those emergency tickets when the time um, comes. We've called the fund, Ryan and I have a joke uh, going, we call the fund Saving Private Ryan. And so if you feel like you want to give something to that, Please get a hold of Donovan. He is organizing all that through the King's Cross account. As you can see, it's super hot here. And uh, we are enjoying a wonderful spot where Billy and his wife have brought us to so that we can just get a little bit away from the monotony of the place that we were staying in. We're allowed to travel on the roads, but that's about it. I want us to remember now and think about the sermon which we have in front of us. And we're going to be talking today about um, those five things that God has told us to do with our lives. Remember what they were? We've been doing them by my calculations as I look at my notes. We've been doing them for about 10 weeks. From the beginning of the new year, we started to look at the five things that God wants you to do with your life. And if you'll remember them, they were... He wants you to have dominion. By the way, all these are found in Genesis 1 and 2, right at the beginning of the story, where God commissions mankind, commissions mankind, Adam and Eve, you and I as his children, to live out these five mandates. Number one, he wants us to have dominion in our life. And we've been talking about that now for 10 weeks, if I include Chantal and Beth's message which were ministered to us the last two weeks. But he also wants us to uh, multiply his image. And it's great if you put your hand up like this, you can remember these five things. The second thing that he wants you to do, he wants you to multiply the image of God on the earth. And we said that we start this by doing that in our lives, in the lives of our children. We help them to walk like God. We help them to talk like God. We help them to think like God. We help them to believe like God. We help them to love like God. We are multiplying the image of God in our families on the earth. The third thing that he, uh, that he wants us to do with our life, and that is work. Of course, this virus has made everybody really terrified that there's not going to be any work. Of course, there is, there is going to be work because God has ordained that as one of our mandates. And if you'll trust Him, He'll sort your work out for you as well. Remember we said, never work for money, work for God. And then the fourth mandate, which was to steward or to look after that which God has provided or already given to us. And the last mandate was marriage or the covenant relationship of marriage where we are totally committed to one another, where we are totally committed to our spouse. Remember, we have that saying in JCC, I can never leave. Even though I go live in another city, even though I'm stuck here in Ivory Coast, I'm still very much connected to my brothers and sisters in Joburg City Church. So the last two weeks, both of those two weeks that we've seen ministry has been about uh, deliverance from addiction. This was what Chantal uh, spoke about. She spoke about how to have dominion over 
chemical or drug addiction in our life. And of course, you can't have dominion if you've got addictions in your life. That's a, a really important sermon. Uh, excuse me if I keep touching my nose. The sweat is running off me. And I know we're not supposed to touch our face, but there's a whole lot of sweat happening here. Um, and so Chantal began to teach us about the importance of ruling over addictions in our life and how addictions will cause us to lose dominion. If you didn't watch that sermon because you think somehow, well, you know, addiction doesn't apply to you, I encourage you to go watch that sermon again. When Ryan and I watched it, we realized that slowly but surely, we were becoming addicted to our cell phones. We didn't want to operate. We didn't want to think. We were stuck in this place and we're thinking, we need to get every single piece of news, every single piece of information out there. But actually, we had to be weaned from constantly wondering what the next person is saying on that electronic advice, uh, device. So I want to advise you and encourage you to watch that sermon again. Put on a different set of glasses and say, Lord, what is it that I'm addicted to that's causing me to lose my dominion? And now Beth, last week, she taught us the incredibly important message of how to have dominion over sickness. She used that wonderful teaching from the story of when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda and he healed that man who was crippled from his birth. I want to encourage you to watch that. It's going to encourage you to confront sickness head on without becoming afraid as we face the crisis of sickness across the world. I want to really encourage you to listen to those two sermons. But now we've come to this, dom this dominion mandate again, and I want to look at another characteristic, another attack from the, er the enemy that causes us to lose dominion. If you're following the sermons, if you've been following, either by attending JCC, Joburg City Church, or you've been watching on your devices, you'll see that we've come to, uh, or we've come to understand that there are basically 13 things that the enemy has designed against our life to rob us of dominion. Those 13 things are listed in Genesis 3 and 4. And we've come to the eighth one. So I want you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3, verse, 12, verse 13. And we're actually going to read the word that we're going to be talking about today that God wants you to have dominion over. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 13. It says these words, And the Lord said to the woman, What have you done? And the woman said, The 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 devil, the serpent, deceived me and I ate. Remember, this serpent is a picture and a description of the devil. The Bible calls him the serpent. It calls him the devil. It calls him the dragon. And it calls him Satan. And so the woman says that she became deceived. And the thing that we're going to talk about today, that I'm going to preach and teach you today, is how to get rid of of the virus of deception. Because if you don't get rid of deception in your life, you're going to lose dominion. Now this sermon today might feel a little bit heavy for you, but it's imperative that you don't allow deception to take root in your life and to bore its root right down into your understanding so that you lose this dominion. God wants you to rule. God wants you to have dominion in your life in those five areas. But the thing that robs us is deception. Let's get a little bit of background to the story of what we just read in Genesis 3 verse 13. Let's read from Genesis 3 from verse 1. And we'll get a, we'll get a, a handle on what actually happened when Satan deceived the woman and Adam agreed with this. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Turn there in your Bibles. It says these words, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said, you shall not eat from the tree of the fruit of the garden, uh, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden? God has said, you shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So you can see Satan coming here. Remember, Satan doesn't take dominion in your life by pounding on you. He takes dominion on, over your life by deceiving you. And you're going to see what it says in verse 4. It said, Then the serpent said to the woman, You won't surely die. God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. I want you to remember, you know, Adam wasn't in some different part of the garden tending the, the garden somewhere in a different place. He was present when this deception was happening, and he did nothing about it. This deception, we need to see, comes into Adam and Eve's lives because, listen carefully, they would not be denied. Yes, the situation. They had every single provision made for them in the garden. God had given them every bit of food, every bit of provision to provide for them, but they still wanted to eat from that one tree. They would not be de denied. Deception enters like a virus into our lives when we will not be denied. When we will not trust God to, that He has given us the things that we need for this life. You know, we start to believe that God is keeping something away from us. We think God is holding out on us. Remember what Eve did. She thought, why has God done want me to eat from that tree? What's God keeping back from me? I know He's trying to keep me from being wise, from being like Him. You see, deception enters into our lives. When we will not be denied, when we do not trust that the very things that God has blessed us with are somehow not enough, or there's something that God is holding out on us. And I want you to know that all deception enters into our life just like that, in this very same way as it says in Genesis chapter 3. Deception came into Eve's life. When she would not be denied. Deception begins when we start to misascribe trust to God. When we start to think God is holding out on us. God is holding something away from us. God is not wanting to bless us. When we start to be suspicious of our Heavenly Father. Deception finds its entrance. And while we could look at Adam and even say, wow, that was a terrible thing for you to do. What's a much better thing for you to do in order to, do in order to deal with deception is to consider, are you doing this? Have you come to a place where you said, God, why don't you bless me with that now? I need that in order to live right now. The things that you've given to me, the thing that you've provided for me is not enough. Why are you holding out on me? That will open the door to deception. And remember, it's not about deception, but it's the thing that deception can steal and rob us of. Deception can rob us of dominion and rulership. And we're living in a time now in the world where it requires the sons and daughters of God to really be exercising dominion. Now, as you understand deception and as you understand the insidious nature of deception you realize that there are different levels of deception you know we don't start off with the worst kind of deception but we realize that deception comes in in this way all deception finds its entrance when we cannot trust God when we cannot Put that third foundational truth into our life, faith in God. 
When we starting to think God is holding out on us, that there's something that is keeping away from us. There's something that is denying us from heaven. You know, deception begins when we become suspicious of God. When we become suspicious that He's denying us a blessing or denying us His provision. When we think that, God, why don't you act on our behalf? I realized that Ryan and I could fall into this deception as we were as we were trusting in Him and not continually trusting Him by saying, God, we know you could snap your fingers and translate us back to South Africa. You know, this morning we actually stood with our suitcases saying, God, we're ready to go back. We did it as a prophetic action, but not with one of mistrust, but with one of trust and deep faith in our God, who is able to meet all of our needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. We start to think that we can't trust God. We can't trust in the absolute goodness of our Heavenly Father. This is when deception finds its entrance. And I want God's Holy Spirit to begin to enlighten our understanding and show us the levels of deception that have crept into our lives. You know, the Bible shows us a very key process of how the levels of deception actually work. And we're going to look at that now. I want you to turn in your Bibles, give you time to turn there, to Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Because Paul shows us in Romans chapter 1 how deception, when it finds entrance through our unwillingness to give thanks and to be grateful, how it spirals downwards to different levels of deception. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit that He will show you where your deception is, where deception has penetrated your heart so that you can repent and turn away from that and begin to act in a different way. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Let's read it together. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The first sign of deception is that you begin to suppress the truth. You start to think that God is not good. You start to suppress the truth that Jesus hasn't really saved you or that Jesus can't save you from your present situation. You begin to suppress that truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, it speaks about the belt of truth having, holding our pants up when we go into battle with the other pieces of armor. The belt of truth. Make sure that you're not hindering the truth of God's word by believing a lie that God has not seen to all of your needs as you are sitting there. Don't let deception find entrance. Look at the next level of deception that very quickly spirals down to. Verse 21. Let's look at verse 21. It says these words. And even though they knew God, you can understand the they here is talking about the people of God. They knew God. They did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts became darkened. The next level of deception is when we do not honor God. When we do not give thanks to God. Can you see those two words? They did not honor God, nor give thanks to Him. Honoring God is when you say, God, I know that you know what my needs is. You know all things. Even when Jesus taught us to pray, He said, when you pray, pray knowing that God knows your needs before you even have them. That's why He says, these ones who were the ones who knew God. That's why this deception thing is so dangerous. We're not talking to the unsaved here. We're not talking to the unbeliever here. We're talking to those who know God. And deception enters in when we do not honor God. 
when we do not say, God, you know, you know what I had need of before I even ask, before I even have need of it. And when we do not give thanks for the very things that we already have. Now you'll see what happens. The person's mind becomes speculating into darkness. The thinking becomes futile. The questioning of God's goodness. The questioning of God's provision. The questioning of God's presence. How many of you found that this week? You just kind of feel that because of this crisis that's going on, you feel, hey, maybe God has left me. And we start to speculate in the darkness of this thinking because we have stopped honoring God or giving thanks to God. Don't let this level of the virus of deception penetrate your life. Because it's very difficult to come back from this place. You'll see the next level of deception that he speaks about. Because of the roots of deception. Starts with this not giving thanks and honoring God. Is found in verse 24. Let's look at verse 24. Where we find another level of how bad this deception can actually get in the believer's life. To rob them of their dominion. It says in verse 24. God gave them over. Look what he gave them over to. The lusts of their hearts. You see the lusts are those things that we will not be denied. We say I'm going to have that thing no matter what. Remember later on in the story that Cain actually kills his brother because he lusts after the favor that God gives Abel. This level of deception is so dangerous because you'll notice it says God gives them over. This is a very dangerous and precarious position to live as a believer. Because it says that at this point, it's God who's resisting the proud. Remember the Bible said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who are the proud? The proud are those who will not trust God. The humble are those who say, God, I believe that you've met all my needs according to your riches by Christ Jesus. See, the humble are, are willing to, to trust God and His provision. To live a humble lifestyle means to live a lifestyle of verbalizing thanksgiving to God every day. Every hour of every day. Every minute of every day. Whether you're doing it inside or you're verbalizing it outside. This is a very dangerous level to be in deception. I remember the story of a great evangelist, a South African evangelist, who fell into deception and ran off with his personal assistant, his secretary. And the deception got so deep and so uh, burdensome, so damaging, that God actually began to resist them. The tragic end of that story is that both him and his secretary were killed in a motor vehicle accident. Now, I believe, I still do believe, that both him and his secretary went to heaven. But what you need to see is that when God hands us over, a lot of times we are unaware of it. This level of deception, as I said, is not a place where you want to live. This is not a place where we want to test God on. This level of deception in the life of Adam and Eve came to the time where they said, you know what, we don't need God. We'll make coverings for ourselves. This is the kind of deception that is trumped up and puffed up with pride that says, God, I don't need to give thanks to you. I'll work this out for myself. I'll work harder. I'll try harder. I'll try better. No, no. This deception is a deception that is very, very difficult to come back to. And I trust that none of you, none of you that are listening, have had this virus of deception penetrate this deep into your heart. Oh, I pray for you. We pray for you that this will not be so, especially in this time of crisis and damage that we are living in. See, a humble lifestyle is a lifestyle of constantly giving thanks for God's myriad and multiplied blessings on your life. 
Look at the next level, verse 25. It says, not only, not only did they, did God hand them over, but they began to exchange the truth of God for a lie. They started to think that small is big and big is small. They started to think that sin is not really sin. It's not bad. It's not, it's just, you know, my weakness. This level of deception can reach a place where we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And you can see here, yeah, they begin to worship the creature, ourselves. Remember what Adam and Eve wanted? They said, we want to be like God. We begin to worship ourselves, and we stop worshiping the Creator, the Lord who has given us all good things to enjoy. This level of deception is when we exchange the truth of God. How does exchanging the truth of God look like? It looks like, as in the story of Adam and Eve, when they said, we'll save ourselves. We'll make a covering for ourselves. Watch out. Make sure that this level of deception has not penetrated penetrated yourselves. Now, remember that story that I told you about the evangelist and his, and his secretary who I ran with, who, who he ran away with. I think this is where we reach the lowest level of deception, and it's found in verse 32. This level of deception is so serious that nobody can come back from this. And I want us to see what this actually looks like. In verse 32, the lowest and worst level of deception, it describes it in this way. It says, although they know the ordinance of God. Can you hear what it says? They know what God's word says. That those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. This is by far the worst and most dangerous level of deception. Can you see this level of deception is not only contaminating yourself, but it's contaminating those around you. It's when you live out an example of not, uh, of, of being really a hypocrite, of saying, you know, do as I say, but you're not actually doing it. You actually start to teach your children. You say, yes, you should read your Bible, but you don't do it. You start saying, yes, you should go to church, but you don't go to church. You see, this level of deception is actually damaging to other people's lives. This level of deception is when I'm so deceived that I'm telling you to live a certain way, but I myself am presenting an example that does not really live that way. There are many examples of this. I think as a leader in God's church, as a leader of the house church, this becomes really important. That you're not telling other people to have a prayer life, and you're not having a prayer life. Because this level of deception has the capacity to contaminate and hurt other people's lives, and cause them to themselves become deceived. You'll see this the deepest level of deception. And when we start teaching others by modeling a Christian life that is not an authentic life of thanksgiving and praise for all that God has done for us. Now, up till now, this virus of deception is really being described in its various levels as something that's super destructive, particularly to rob us from our dominion. But what's the answer to this? Let's consider what the Bible says. What medicine should we take? How do we combat deception from growing and going to those various levels? The first one, the first thing that we should start doing is make sure that you're not murmuring and complaining. You know, uh, we realize or I realize that we could so easily fall into this. We're in a situation where it seems like we have a government 
and a, and a ruling authority that's kind of forgotten that we hear. They've, they've closed the borders. They, there's an unwillingness, it seems, to help us to get out. But remember, we can either murmur and complain about that, or I can murmur and complain about that, or I can give thanks to God that He's got my back, that He's got Ryan's back, that He is able to look after us and do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even dream or imagine. The first thing you want to do to combat deception and remove the destructive power of deception from your life is to stop murmuring and complaining. Now that's the negative thing. The positive thing, the next thing you want to do is start to give thanks to God. Start to every day when you wake up, before you go to sleep, before you have lunch, before you have dinner, before you have breakfast, at the table, say, Father, I thank you for your provision on our lives. Thank you for your blessing. In other words, get your faith up by speaking God's word, by confessing the truth of God's word that God is not holding out on you. Live a lifestyle of thanksgiving and praise. This is so important to do. I want to, as a challenge to you, ask you to do this as a house church. I want you to take your device, that very dangerous thing that you can become addicted to, and turn it into a blessed item by writing out a list of 10 things that you are thankful and grateful for. And within your house church, I want you to send it to each other. Send your list to your house church leader to your house church elder and pastor. Say, you know, these are the things that I'm grateful for. There's 10 things. I can give you some ideas. I'm really grateful that Jesus is in my life and that no matter what happens, I'm guaranteed a place with Him in glory. I'm really thankful for that. I don't know about you. As I register and see the amount of people dying, I'm thankful that this life is not the end, but that when we pass out of this body, when we leave this body, as Paul said, when I'm absent from this body, I'll see him face to face. We need to be living a lifestyle of thanksgiving and praise for that. We need to thank God for our children, that our children have responded to Jesus and that they've come to Christ. We need to thank God for our homes, that we have the places of shelter, that we've been able to run to and stay in as we see this sickness ravage the lives of so many people. What do you have to be thankful for? There's so many things to be thankful. You could spend the rest of your days, every breath you take, declaring something that you are thankful for. I want you to write that list out and I want to challenge you to send that list around to each other in the church. Start feeding each other some medication to get rid of the virus of deception. And then lastly, this is what I want you to do. I want you this week, as you look at your list, begin to speak this over yourselves, over your family, over your loved one, over your members in your house church. Speak thanksgiving and praise, and you'll begin to reverse this deception that so insidiously creeps into our lives. Live a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Speak these ten things over your life while you are living upon this earth. I want to challenge you that this week, you make this week a lifestyle change. A lifestyle change of declaring with your mouth what you believe with your heart, that Jesus is Lord of your life and that God raised him from the dead and that you are steadfastly sure that he has met all of your needs that you have in this life. I want to challenge you to do that. I want to encourage you to do that. Most of all, I want you if you are one of those people who are saying, you know, John, I really don't have anything to be thankful for. Make sure that if you're one of those people who's saying that today, and that deception has crept so deep in your heart, that you make contact with your house church leader, your house church elder, and you spend some time getting them 
to encourage you and to, uh, to provoke you to a lifestyle change of thanksgiving. Rani and I want to thank you that we could spend this time together and that we could uh, spend this, these moments just speaking about how to have dominion in our life. As you enjoy your fellowship with your family and your fellowship with one another, maybe not face to face, but via your device, please make sure that you are living a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Blessings, blessings, blessings.